Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BitPay, Kraken, and Mitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. Welcome back. We have an awesome interview with Anthem Blanchard. He's CEO and founder of Anthem Vault. Been a longtime friend of mine, even before Bitcoin even existed. His father played a major, major role in international monetary law. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Anthem. Thanks for having me, Trace. So let's start with your father, like how you kind of were born into this very monetary family. Yeah, I know my father is known as the original gold bug by some. He helped to push for the relegalization of gold ownership in the U.S., which had been prohibited since 1933 through an executive order by FDR. And so through tireless uh, advocacy, he smuggled gold even illegally from Canada. He could have been thrown in prison for many years and fined hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, minimum. Uh, you know, he basically crusaded for a matter of about three year period. And during that time, gold actually became legalized. So about 40 years ago, actually, uh, January 1st was the first day that a U.S. citizen could again own gold in over 40 years. Wow. Yeah. See, a lot of people don't really understand just how deep Satoshi's understanding of monetary history and monetary law are all the way from Isaac Newton, who developed the gold standard and set in order a new age of money, to Satoshi choosing the birthday on his Ning account. And the birthday was April 1975. The April date was actually the date that Franklin D. Roosevelt issued Executive Order 6102, prohibiting the ownership of gold and 1975 is the year that your father helped get gold re-legalized for American citizens to own. So Satoshi was very well aware of these events that had happened. So to really understand Bitcoin, I would assert that you have to understand gold. So what are some of these secrets of gold? Because, I mean, if you want to learn the truth about money, you're going to have to learn it on your own. Like, what, what are some of these secrets that have, you could say, been passed down in the family? Sure. So, I mean, I would say maybe most importantly of all is that gold is the most beautiful wearable art. Um, it's got the lowest melting point. It's the most malleable. It's the most spendable without breaking. The lowest melting point means it takes the least amount of energy. Um, prior in history, before we had technological advancements that made it uh, less costly to verify, because of its unique color, uh, it was very easily recognizable from any other metal on earth. And because it was so equally found roughly around the world, but still scarce enough to still have a relatively high concentration of value and density that it, those very simple qualities have made it very good money over time. You know, this equidistribution in the Earth's crust, in a way, you could say it's kind of like an analog blockchain. Uh, and that's really what Isaac Newton's gold standard did. It helped uh, balance payments between nations and uh, settle up balance sheets and things of that nature, international balance sheets uh, of states. Uh, it's an interesting thing, like when the Navy pilots have their emergency pack packed, gold sovereigns are included in there. And that's because at all times and in all circumstances, gold remains money for thousands of years even. So it's got this incredible history. It's outlasted every government, every fiat currency. There's thousands of them in the fiat currency graveyards. We had actually done a podcast earlier a couple of years ago where we talked about the concept of a numeraire mm -hmm. and about gold's role as a numeraire. Maybe you can help refresh the audience on you know what a numeraire is and why gold is so important as a numeraire. Now, I remember that, Trace. I actually remember really loving that analogy that you gave with the numeraire. And 
really what we're talking about is relative value and finance will call that sometimes the base 100 or just looking at what is one thing worth relative to another thing. One of the benefits that gold has had just because it has been held now by billions of people, all central banks do hold it. And because most gold is not used for industrial purposes and there is so much of it above ground that creates a lot of liquidity, which minimizes volatility. So it's for all of these reasons why it actually makes for a very good uh, numeraire of being able to gauge gold versus all of these other investments that fluctuate much, much more at a pure industrial or commercial supply and demand. Yeah, because I mean, we're, we're talking about numeraire, like the unit of account for your financial statements. Most people, for whatever reason, they use as their numeraire U.S. dollars, euros, Swiss francs, uh, Australian dollars. That's the lens through which they see their financial world and situation. Uh, but that's not necessarily accurate. Is that not necessarily a good thing to do? Does it give them an accurate picture of what's really going on? I mean, maybe you can delve into that a little bit. Well, it's an ultimate deception because when we've had all these trillions of dollars over the last six years of quote unquote quantitative easing, which is really just a you know, $5 phrase for currency creation by the central banks. I mean, we've, we've seen that Basically, what it does is it devalues the value of your currency. And we see this in, in the sense of, uh, core goods and services over, you know, the last, you know, five, six years rising tremendously. Um, you know, we, we, we see that wages have not commensurately risen. And you know, ultimately, it's a very, very, very subtle, but super destructive form of theft. And it's very insidious because you don't see it in one fail swoop. It's not taken from one particular entity. It's taken from the whole of the populace that gets paid uh, in whatever that currency is. So, you know, it's it's definitely very relevant. I, I think the issue has been, Trace, is that the payment system has been completely predicated on the health of the global banking system. And really, it's been a prisoner's dilemma that central banks have been in because they felt compelled to continue to bail out the banking system in order to have international payments be able to exist. This is a much larger problem. We've talked extensively on the podcast about the counterparty risk and the quality of the bank's balance sheets and all these things. But when we're talking about the numeraire, when we're talking not necessarily about the veins or the payment system or like wires and things and credit cards, but instead when we're talking about the blood, when we're talking about the currency itself, this is where fiat currencies like the dollar, we really have a very tenuous situation. Uh, for example, in the U.S. Constitution, it uses the phrase dollar twice. And one of those signs is in the slave clause, you know, a hotly contentious clause in the Constitution. You would think that before it was adopted that they would have agreed on what the terms meant in the clause, right? And a term like dollar which raises the issue, well, what is a dollar? And it actually did have a definition. You know, in the 1792 Coinage Act, it was defined as 371.25 grains of fine silver. So it's a weight and a purity of a particular metal. Uh, it was a certain amount of silver. When you define it as something like that, we can now start making conversions, mm -hmm. right? Well, under federal law, under the Constitution, no state shall emit bills of credit or make anything but gold or silver coin a tender and payment of debts. You know, that means that Article 1, Section 8, there's no power given to the federal government to make anything legal tender. The states are restricted from making anything legal tender except gold or silver. But somehow our federal government has made Federal Reserve notes legal tender under 31 U.S.C. 5101 through 5118. Not only that, They've made gold legal tender. So $50 equals one ounce of gold. One ounce of silver equals $1 under federal law. Pennies and nickels and dimes and quarters and all these differing amounts of zinc and copper and everything, those all equal dollars. But last time I checked on the periodic table, like 50 ounces of silver did not equal one ounce of gold. That would be unintelligible. It just wouldn't make any sense. And yet, in our legal code, we've decreed it as such. Are there problems that come about when we're performing 
economic calculation when we have unintelligible legal code? Like what, what are some of these unintended consequences? Well, yeah, I think anytime you have the government controlling anything, you know, that it, whether it's price, um, I think now you're seeing it even furthermore with interest rates, which is really the price of money. I mean, ultimately the market isn't setting the price and it's not, it, it's not setting what the value should be. And so the problem that you see again and again with government, whenever they're propping up currency or, or whatever, an industry it could be through subsidies, you know, all of a sudden, uh, it's kind of like the analogy in the stock market where you take the escalator up and the elevator down. And, you know, that's what you see happen because you, the escalator up in the case of government is the artificial support, but there comes a pain point when there's so much stress. So ultimately the government can only pay for something by taking other people's payment ultimately through one form or another, whether it's through direct taxation or indirect taxation, as we discussed through inflation. Mo- inflation. No, it's definitely a very bad thing. I think what happened, Trace, is that over time, really before the age of the internet and certainly before the age of computing, it costs so much to actually process payments that perhaps you almost needed to have bank accounting established as it is, where perhaps you needed to have the banks making enough money on the credit side of the business to actually be able to pay for clearing just because clearing was done through paper drafts. I mean, it's incredibly inefficient. So, I mean, if we think now to the time of the internet where the cost of communication is down to fractions of a penny, you know, it, it kind of almost in a way justifies the past. But the problem is, is that in the present, you know, we've now been, you know, widely adopted internet for, you know, over 10 years now. Um, as a, you know, general Western society. And we don't need to have the credit side of a lending, uh, uh, institution to then, you know, have to clear payments for us. It's simply not necessary. So you can see the cost inefficiency. I mean, think about it. We can have a video call with someone completely across the world, Iceland to Australia right now, instantly. That's instant communication. Yet if I want to send a bank wire right now to someone in Australia, I, I can't even do it right now because the banks are closed right now because, you know, we're happy to be doing the interview after hours. And you know, secondly, it's going to cost me probably upwards of $50 and my time. And it's not even going to maybe even get there for a day or two. I mean, and you can't track it either. Yeah. Yeah. That too. You know, you can track a $5 package, but you can't track a $500,000 wire. That's correct. I mean, we're, we're talking about just this obsolete antiquated system and Chief Justice John Roberts, his first report on the state of the Supreme Court, he was talking about there's a constitutional crisis because the federal judges, their salaries aren't keeping up with inflation. You know, Article 3 of the Constitution, they're supposed to be life tenured and their compensation is not supposed to be diminuated, not supposed to be interfered with. We're not supposed to interfere with the obligation of contracts. And yet when we change the definition of a term, that makes up 50% of every transaction in the economy, that's exactly what we're doing, isn't it? We're interfering with the atomic unit, the actual molecule from which we build our entire economy. And so when we interfere with that, is it really any wonder that we have buildings falling over and not being constructed properly and needing to be bailed out? But all the bailing out does is just misallocate more capital. You know, we produce wheat. Like, why do we produce wheat? We produce it to eat, right? Why do we produce steel? We produce steel to build bridges. Why do we produce oil? You know, we produce oil to fuel things and to power things and to build things with. But why do we produce gold? We got 160,000 tons in above ground stockpiles. Like, why do we continue digging it out of the earth? It's a great question. It's a simple answer, in my opinion, and that's human action. Quite frankly, human history has a pretty clear um, portrayal that at the end of the day, anything that's man-made ultimately is fleeting and passing over time. And the fact of the matter is, is that gold or these other elements that are on the periodic table have been around since the creation of Earth. Um, So, I mean, I I would argue that anything that's man-made at all will eventually be fleeting. And that's why gold... And you know, any non-perishable, durable type commodity that has you know, natural scarcity to it will always be a store of value. Um, you know, how good of a store of value is will depend on scarcity and other attributes, I think. But 
But you were the second employee at Gold Money. Oh, te- technically, yes. You Full know, time, the, uh, the equivalent. Yes. So, so you were you were there in the very early days. James Turkey had patents back in 1993 for digital gold currency. You know, trying to apply information age technology to the concept and the application of money. You know, our early early attempts at this, whether it's gold money or digi cash or hash cash. Uh, that Adam Back came up with, you know, is kind of like a horseless carriage, you could say. What do we really have with Bitcoin? You know, you've been around this space for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, this virtual currency, this digital gold currency space. Like, what do we really have with Bitcoin? Well, I would say it's a couple fold. I would say the biggest thing that I think we have is the elimination of credit risk and counterparty risk and settlement risk. So I think that is definitely by far the biggest thing we had. So you know, even some of the digital gold currencies or former digital gold currencies that you mentioned, you know, in that case, really the only technological advancement was digitizing into fractional ownership form. But, you know, really then it was just entries in a accounting, which frankly, in a lot of ways you think would be okay. I think what um, some of those companies ran up against was, a lot of regulation that had been put in over time. And especially before 2008, and even now I think it's taken a few years for a lot of people to digest 2008 now, that there was also kind of a I think, perception of a lack of need from a lot of people. And so I think the combination, and I think you know, Bitcoin and blockchain does way more than even that in terms of you've already touched on this and obviously your podcast too, but the transparency element, the triple entry huge, book, the triple book entry, which is arguably 200 times uh, more uh, accountable. And even more than that, since a traditional double entry accounting audit, we will typically have at the end of a fiscal year, which is 12 months. And even then only typically half of 1% of all the transactions even get audited. So you know, it's, it's tremendous from that standpoint. I mean, you know, you and experts have talked about, it. I mean, the applications are, are, are endless and we haven't even thought of probably 0.05, you know, percent of them or 1% of 0.01% of them. It's, it's, it's incredible. But at Anthem Vault, you know, anthemvault.com, you're actually trying to build out these horseless carriages into cars and Ferraris and airplanes, right? Mm-hmm. Like you guys came out with the independence coin. Mm -hmm. What exactly was this uh, independence coin? Yeah. So independence coin or INN coin, you can check it out, inncoin.co. It was a proof of concept coin that we launched uh, stealth on July 4th of 2014. And uh, we backed it with a hundred grams of gold and 10 million coins mineable X11 script, which is same as dark coin mineable for a year. And someone can redeem a hundred thousand of these INN, these independence coin for one gram of gold in, uh, in their Anthem Vault account. So it was a way to introduce our client base. It was a way to introduce our core team and programming team to an actual implementation of cryptocurrency, build out a wallet, start building out mining pools, things like that. So just to get our feet wet or understanding also to test the market. And it was incredible trace. I mean, we saw our account size double in a matter of about two weeks time, you know, just because we required someone open up a free Anthem vault account in order to actually download the miners. So, you know, that was significant, but what we're doing now is taking that proof of concept and actually making it live. So that way our client base can have spendable gold and Anthem vault that is powered by the power of cryptocurrency. And potentially not just gold. I mean, I'd ask you some more questions, but then we'd be treading into uh, trade secrets, right? And we we don't necessarily want to want to have you revealing to the public your your very innovative plans in this uh, whole area of digital currency, virtual currency, and the application of real monetary science and the experience that you and your family have had and gained uh, in this area over the decades. Why, why should somebody even care about all of this? Like, can't we just go about our life like using whatever everybody else uses? I mean, why, why should anybody care? Well, I mean, people should care because you're only going to find the truth for yourself and ultimately to help protect your family and your children and your children's children for yourself. 
I mean, that, that's just the way life goes. So yeah, no, nobody really cares about your financial condition except yeah, for you. That's correct. You have to self educate. And so everyone else, I mean, the central banks around the world, you know, they're acting out of a fear of these entrenched interests around them failing and ultimately the populace being very upset because they can't pay. They're not acting out of a benevolence of you as the listener or any of us as individuals. So, you know, their action is predicated on other reasoning, not for you yourself best interest, you know, even if potentially a central bank thinks that. So it's key to understanding history that, you know, no paper currency long term has ever survived simply because again, human nature is dictated that if the state has control of the money, then they will continuously abuse that control. And we see it again and again and again. And that's why I think we're going to see a renaissance again, you know, really, and, and really it's, I would say again, back to private money, but I would say now, I think you're going to see a full on private money approach, complete denationalization of money across the board, because it's going to be so obvious to most people, you know, when we do have, and I think this is unfortunate um, consequence of our over levered system. When we do have, um, eventually a, a complete loss in confidence in currencies and national currencies. And hopefully this takes decades and it could, and hopefully it will until there are alternative substitutes. But, um, you know, there is going to be a big reset. Um, we've seen this before when there, when there has been loss in confidence of currency this time around, it's a global paper currency because really all of the world's currency is really dollars when you really start boiling it down. So. You know, really, there is no asset, not national currency any longer anyone can really go to. And the system is all completely, the world system is completely interconnected from a finance standpoint. So it's a very perilous situation. Hopefully there isn't any mass fallout, you know, at least for you know, us in the U.S. or people elsewhere. But, you know, sadly, I, that's not the reality of the situation long term. It's just a timing question. And I mean, you're talking about this crack up boom the amplitude of the business cycle has just been greatly uh, exacerbated due to central bank intervention. I mean, this is what Frederick Hayek got his Nobel Prize for in economics. Anthem Hayek Blanchard. I mean, you're named after this guy, right? And that's why you've got this Hayek coin that you're coming out with mm -hmm. uh, that's going to help people follow the first rule of panic. Uh, do it first. <laughs> you know, because uh, what, what's the, what's the joke? You sit down at a poker game and you gotta, you got within the first couple minutes, you gotta figure out who the patsy is. And if you don't know who the patsy is, then, well, you're the patsy. <laughs> and like these currency wars, financial war, the name of the game is to, to transfer other people's wealth, right? I mean, that's what the central banks, the bankers, the people, the market, that's its function. It's to take the resources from the people, from certain people or, or institutions that have it and transfer it to someone else. I mean, but that's for, just, that's force just transfer, game. force transfer. And that's exactly the problem because us as individuals, we benefit through voluntary transfer and trade and trade and ultimately through trial and error that allows trial and error because it allows competition is ultimately in a lot of ways trial and error. So if you have a government monopolizing, or if you have any entity and happens to government's obviously most powerful. So monopolizing any situation, you lose that element of that businesses. We all use to refine our products and services, which is trial and error. You don't have that benefit any longer. So we benefit as individuals from wealth creation, from value creation, from value creation through voluntary exchanges, not through mandatory value transfers and price setting and pri yes yes and price setting and that's ultimately what happens is you know when we try to have price controls you know when the government tries to set prices or pegs those pegs those price controls they will fail to market forces they'll fail in the form of shortages and rationing they'll fail because they can no longer be maintained like the swiss national bank their euro Swiss franc peg that recently failed 40% revaluation in a single day, mm -hmm. uh, hyperinflation, Czechoslovakia, Argentina, Zimbabwe, uh, Weimar, Germany. I mean, you name it, like every area on earth has gone through this continental dollar in the U S 
it will fail to market forces. If individuals understand the monetary science, the economics, can they actually position themselves to benefit from these things that are happening? Instead of being a victim, can they actually be a beneficiary of this wealth transfer, of this uh, redistribution that happens? I, I think they definitely can. I think the advantage that we have as individuals versus a central bank is that we still have choice because we're not binded to a government, let's say, that we have to be obligated or some kind of other entity that we're obligated to continuously bail them out or continuously service their debts. Or that's just really large and lumbering and doesn't move very quick. Yeah, and that too. Yeah, exactly. And and is, you know, ultimately not making decisions for individuals and they're making decisions as a collective was ultimately, you know, there's, it's very nebulous in terms of anyone benefiting and yeah, very slow and Absolutely. So we can act quickly as individuals. I think understanding this trend, I mean, I'm obviously biased toward gold. I think Bitcoin, I think is, it is only six years old. I am a big believer in cryptocurrency. You know, I, I still think you should treat it more like a growth uh, investment than, you know, long-term value investment, but that also gives you the potential for a lot of multiple, you know, should it continue to grow and keep being the strongest um, from a security standpoint, um, you know, peer-to-peer cryptocurrency network. So, you know, we're talking about not just an exchange rate garden variety change. We're talking about the collapse of a worldwide reserve currency and monetary system, uh, the largest in history. And the U.S. is going to be and is ground zero for this happening. You know, it's great that we have innovative entrepreneurs like yourself working on potential solutions, potential ways for individuals to protect and actually thrive and benefit as a result of this change. Uh, Is there anything you'd like to add as we close out the podcast? I mean, what are you most kind of optimistic about in this whole field of money and currency? Well, I'm optimistic that we do have cryptocurrency and blockchain thanks to Bitcoin's invention, because now, even though we're only six years in, we actually have a solution to the systemic contagion, credit, counterparty risk, settlement risk. All, once you eliminate all those costs, you know, the, the amount of value that we get back to be able to put toward productive means is tremendous. And, and I think once we get over that hump, once we can get some critical mass adoption into different, you know, peer to peer cryptocurrency, decentralized medium of exchange solutions, then I think that we're going to get into a renaissance and I think we're going to continue to see more and more services that, you know, less and less the government has to do. Like you see with Uber on a local level and taxis and you get, you know, see some examples already. I think the more and more as the private sector can help shed away from the government, then the less worse that the fallout will be ultimately from the hyperinflationary event or any other type of monetary or uh, currency crisis and chaos. Yeah. Well, we've had with us the creator of the Independence Coin, the CEO and founder of Anthem Vault, Anthem Blanchard. Thanks for being with us. Always a pleasure, Trace. Thank you. Be sure to get a copy of the free Bitcoin Guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or suggestion? Record your voice at Bitcoin.kn. Don't be shy. To help the show, share Bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise spam the interwebs. Your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate.